The floor is yours. our in, intense uh, and intriguing conference. And in these days, we have been learning uh, a lot of uh, new things, uh, facts, uh, data, uh, figures, etc. So I do not intend to add uh, further material uh, in uh, this direction. I much prefer to utilize my minutes uh, to focus attention on certain uh, uh, points which uh, I deem uh, which are worthwhile of further let's say, thinking and uh, elaboration. Let me start from what I consider three grand myths still persisting in the way the global human trafficking is usually addressed. The first myth is the opinion that there is nothing new. Trafficking is age old, it is often said. Therefore, the skeptics would argue that since trafficking has always been a nuisance, it is a threat we can learn to live with, as we have done in the past. But uh, this attitude, in my opinion, ignores the important transformation occurring at the world level since the 90s of last century. I'm referring both to globalization, which is a new phenomenon different from the inter mere internationalization of uh, economic relations, and uh, in particular, the third industrial revolution, in other words, the digital revolution. These two facts uh, have completely changed uh, the quality and the nature of the phenomenon under consideration. The second myth uh, is that trafficking is just about crime. Now, it is true that criminal activities uh, surged and became global in the 90s. But thinking about trafficking as just another manifestation of criminal behavior misses a larger point, the role played by demanders of the services of trafficked people. To, to that I will come later. The third myth is the idea that human trafficking is an underground phenomenon. Even accepting that it has grown in volume and complexity, many seek to relegate it to a different world than that of ordinary, honest citizens. Instead, uh, this is uh, perhaps uh, the most dangerous of all illusions, because it tends to treat uh, what we observe as uh, exceptional and not as something which is uh, contagious, etc. Now, human trafficking uh, could be approached, as we know, and we have learned in these days in multiple ways. And, um, in particular, a, a lot of attention eh, is the emphasis on trafficking as a migration problem, which eh, also has led to the criminalization of victims who generally violate prostitution and immigration laws of the hosting countries. Despite their traumatic victimization, these persons tend to receive only very limited assistance from the authorities in the countries in which they were forced to work. Neither regular admonitions by UN agencies nor accusations by civil society organizations have changed this approach. We know that today it has become clear that the immediate repatriation of trafficked people because they are undocumented migrants generally prevents uh, the successful prosecution of the traffickers. And this is a real paradox. I think, I hope that people do that uh, in bona fide because otherwise that would be very serious. As I said, I will not uh, devote attention to data. Let me only make two exceptions, uh, very short. One um, is um, the last report by UNODC, November uh, 2014, Christine the other day presented, signaled that the phenomenon is not only on the rise, but its interplay with the social crisis uh, is more complex than it has been since the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. But in particular, if we look at the data of the report uh, 2014, we observe that 49% of detected victims are adult women. 33% are children, out of which 21% girls and 12 boys. The remaining 18% are adult men. Now, 
If one sums up the two figures referring to the female component of society, one obtains that 70% of all trafficked persons belong to the feminine gender. On the other hand, 72% of traffickers are men and 28% are women. I think that there is no need for me to comment on these figures, but it's a point that is proper to remind. Today, trafficking is a, basically a feminine question. The second, let's say, small piece um, uh, remark has to do with the fact that uh, more than 90% of countries criminalize trafficking in person since the Palermo Protocol came into force more than 12 years ago. However, impunity prevails, as the uh, UNODC has documented, with all too few consequences for the perpetrators. This reflects the fact that legislation does not always comply with the protocol, and even when legislation is enacted, implementation often falls short. The result is that the number of convictions globally has remained extremely low, while the number of detected child victims, particularly girls, has scandalously increased. And that is another paradox. In other words, we are, I mean, the victims are those who suffer more than the perpetrators. But having said so, let me focus on my four, I have four basic points. The first basic point uh, to which I would like to draw your attention, uh, the first one is that um, it is striking that uh, in the by now vast literature dealing with human trafficking, the neglect of the demand side for trafficking flows. That is a fact you can ascertain looking through the literature. And that is a point that uh, our president, Maggie Archer, correctly underlined. I have a quote uh, that is no need for me to repeat. This is a real paradox, to say the least, because if one considers that trafficking is driven by high profits or, to better, to say, by rent-seeking attitudes, because economists know the difference between profits and rents, it is obvious that it is the demand side, the engine sustaining this trade. It is the demand for cheap labor, cheap labor, for organ transplant, sexual services that explain how traffickers and their networks have continually adopted and refined their activities, even at the cost of temporary setbacks such as jail sentences. Jail sentences are of no interest to them because they will repeat later. Until traffickers face a diminished incentives to trade, in other words, less demand and lower margins, it is futile to talk about increasing criminal justice uh, measures. It is true that the characters involved in trafficking uh, are uh, uh, abominable criminals. That is obvious. But what drives them is the search for rents. It is uh, certainly true that the bans trafficking in women for sexual exploitation deserve the harshest possible punishment. But what about those who purchase these services, or the families that rely on illegal aliens for domestic help when they know that they are illegal aliens. It seems to me that we will never make progress in the struggle against the trafficking if all our attention is placed on the suppliers of most morally repugnant trade. Here yesterday there was a clarification. When we talk about suppliers, we do not refer to the victims. Victims is the third party. The suppliers are the organizations, mafia type organization who organize uh, the supply chains, etc. Et that is uh, my first point. My second point uh, has to do with uh, a common, sometimes confusion, between human smuggling versus human trafficking. It is commonly asserted that in spite of some overlaps, human trafficking is not to be confused with human smuggling. The argument runs as follows, I synthesize. Human smuggling involves consent, and quite often the person involved pays the smuggler for passage. The other day in the Mediterranean, we happened to know that the people who passed away had to pay $1,000 
to get the passage. So they pay. On the other hand, uh, trafficking victims uh, either never consented, or if they initially did, that consent had been rendered meaningless by the coercive or deceptive action of the traffickers. Moreover, migrant smuggling ends with the migrant arrival at their destination. Trafficking involves the ongoing exploitation of the victim. Now, apart from practical considerations such as voluntary smuggled migrants are left with exorbitant debts that lead them into sweet shops or other exploitative working conditions, I do believe that even at the conceptual level, the presumption of voluntary action as a prerequisite to differentiate smuggling and trafficking is not as robust as it might appear. Uh, yesterday, I think it was Vittorio Osle who raised the, the, the point or other people. In other words, uh, to choose uh, does not always imply to consent. That is uh, a theoretical, uh, let's say, mistakes that sometimes uh, we keep on doing, uh, making up. Now, it is obvious that uh, under this uh, uh, condition, uh, one clarification, uh, even at the, in the international organization level, it's uh, important. To conclude on this point, uh, we all of us know the famous Friedman expression, free to choose, which uh, he developed in his uh, important book, Capitalism and Freedom, published in 1962. But what Friedman uh, misunderstood, perhaps, uh, is the difference between free to choose and free to be able to choose, which makes uh, a lot of difference. I come to my third point. In the light of what I just said, one can understand the fundamental role that in present day market economies is being played by socially responsible consumers. Now, this is a, a res nova. As we know, Caritas in Veritate is the first pontifical document of the social doctrine of the church where for the first time, I underline, first time in history, the notion of a, socially responsible consumers appears, number 66. In other words, it is not only firms, entrepreneurs, who are socially responsible, but also consumers. Why? Because we, as consumers, having a purchasing power, we can utilize this power, which is real power, in order to, as we say today, vote by the wallet. Because any time we make a consumer decision, we make a moral decision. It's not a technical, as in general, utilitarianism has taught us to believe. Because if I have a choice of buying something from alpha or beta, and I know that alpha is uh, something which uh, does not uh, comply with the fundamental human rights, for instance, and in spite of knowing that I buy alpha, I am as much responsible as the producer of alpha. So, in such a context, it's um, a significant novelty that has been occurring the last 30 years is the diffusion of the notion of sustainable and responsible investment. Now, I have no time to go through the history of a sustainable and responsible investment, but it's a fascinating history. And I have to say that the great merit of this history goes to the nuns, to the sisters, in particular American sisters. Uh, there are uh, fascinating stories to say about that. The idea is uh, to use uh, financial markets to express uh, what uh, Hirschman called uh, not only exit, but uh, the voice option. In other words, uh, protest. As we know, this idea goes back in the 70s when um, Wesley, the Reverend, uh, the 19th century Rev Quaker, Reverend John Wesley, uh, introduced the idea that uh, the principle of responsibility does not concern solely what one does but also that which you allow others to do with the resources that you have at your disposal. So as I said, if I invest my savings in a company that works against my moral values, and I am aware of this, 
I am indirectly responsible for the consequences that come from the operation of that company. Now, on the wake of this idea, in the 70s of last century, the Baptist Reverend Leon Sullivan uh, entered the board of director of General Motors to start a strategy of pressure on the multinational companies that contributed to maintain apartheid alive in South Africa. And as we know, his work was so successful that in 1977, he was able to publish the Sullivan Principles. There are seven principles that now form a sort of Magna Carta for the active shareholders. Now, this uh, is uh, uh, so important uh, that uh, for the reason that I'm going to say in a minute, connected to the attempt by Raggi, which is very, very recent in this regard. And one of the seven principles of the Sullivan principles has to do with human trafficking. And it is a pity that sometimes we do not reinvigorate this idea. Now I come to my fourth point. Uh, which deals directly to the particular discipline to which I belong, namely economics, uh, science. Human trafficking has been conspicuously neglected by economics. Of course, there are exceptions. But if you look at the literature, economic literature, you will notice that human trafficking, we have a lot of literature on uh, organized uh, crime, mafia type, plenty, drug, uh, uh, illicit, but not on human trafficking. And that it poses a question, why is that so? Why economists have, uh, in general, apart from few exceptions, under-evaluated the human trafficking issue? As I said, uh, the literature on organized crime and illegal markets is huge, huge, literally huge, uh, but not uh, on uh, human trafficking. And uh, again, uh, that has to do with the fact that uh, if we want to be serious from an economic point of view and tackle the issue of human trafficking, we have to come to talk about uh, the role today of multinational enterprises. Now, despite uh, this uh, enormous potential, multinational enterprises are not sufficiently living up to expectations. They do a lot of good things, uh, we know, uh, efficiency, productivity, etc. Many have come increasingly under pressure to demonstrate what uh, they operate in a socially responsible manner. But we are yet at the, the beginning. Now, consider, for instance, the role that can be played by multinationals to overcome the problem stemming from the lack of international legal personality and the limited liability of enterprises, as well as uh, the consequences arising when the activity is performed within the territory of those states that are not willing or are not able to protect uh, human rights. It's a fact that uh, over the last few decades, uh, the systematic violation of human rights of this special category of moral rights, which are known as jura hominum has been associated with the action of multinational companies. U UN estimates that today there are over 70,000 multinational companies worldwide. Now, we know that globalization, in fact, has highlighted the novelty unknown uh, by the ages preceding it, that while multinational companies work globally, governments regulate nationally. The consequence is that the legal tools uh, that best fit into the process of economic transformation are not the authoritative ones, but those forged by those who work in the market, like the contracts that have by now become the top regulating sources. The international circulation of atypical contractual models is ever more intense. Legal offices of big multinational companies and international entrepreneurial associations create them. This is how the business community, which is a, an example of what has been called uh, by political scientists a soft law, created a communal law that surpasses the juridical discontinuities of national legislature. And um, 
For almost all the 20th centuries, problems like those now highlighted have been conceptualized as political problems, whose solution should be entrusted to public actors, whose job is to fix the laws and enforce them, while the companies should follow the laws. Now, what is happening today is the result of the disappearance of adequate mechanism of enforcement should the norm be broken. And that is uh, what happens in particular in the area we are studying. In recent years, public discourse on the relationship between companies and human rights has been blocked uh, on the point uh, that it is not possible to find uh, the necessary consensus of the notion on the notion of human rights. Precisely because human rights cannot be given by the state, but only protected by the state, given that uh, the rights exist even if a government does not welcome or protect them. That is at least what I think about. That is why on July 25th, the UN Secretary Kofi Annan nominated John Ruggi from Harvard University as the special representative to whom he entrusted to identify the most clamorous cases uh, of human rights violation by companies and to compile a compendium of good practices. Now, in the summer 2011, four years ago, Raghi finished uh, his term publishing the guiding principles, known also as guiding principles on business and human rights implementing the UN Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework. Now, which problems this report raises? Three problems. First problem, that the approach followed is very traditional. It's an approach according to which national governments were held responsible for human rights, and the responsibility of companies came after in a, a secondary position. Second problem, and that is very intriguing, at least to me, that the ultimate reasons for which human rights should be respected wherever and in any case is economic and not moral in nature. Companies should respect human rights, this is the message, because otherwise they would lose a reputational capital accumulated uh, over time after the sentence of the so-called uh, tribunal of public uh, opinion. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I said before, the Sullivan principles are based uh, on completely different assumptions, theoretical assumptions. So now the question is, how to choose between the Sullivan principles and the rugged principles? This is an open problem. Eh? It's an open problem. And nobody dares to tackle this issue. In my opinion, that is a major default, because a world should come out of this because the two set of principles are based on different presuppositions and they achieve different results. Now, I have noticed, I am not an expert in the area, but uh, some theoretical proposals called the fair shared theory of company responsibilities of human rights, some scholars, they are trying to find a way out. But it seems to me that, that it's an argument where, for instance, uh, an academy such as this one might say something, because uh, as far as I know, most people have to, uh, are waiting for that. I almost finished my time, so I come to the conclusion. These are the, the, where the four points about which I would, like to, I would have liked to draw. My, my first conclusion is that uh, the current state system based on territorial sovereignty but characterized by uneven state capacity is wholly inadequate to the task uh, of fighting against trafficking. This fact suggests why it is urgent to move decisive steps uh, towards the creation of what I would call World Anti-Trafficking Agency, VATA. In the absence of an agency or translational authorities that can enforce the rules laid down in the various conventions and treaties, the trafficking problem will never find an adequate solution. Of course, we have a highly meritorious UN agencies such as the UNACR, UNODC, and others. They are highly meritorious, 
but they are not proper multilateral institutions supported and co-managed by a broad spectrum of countries. For instance, the funds continue to come on voluntary basis from a coalition of few countries. On the other hand, financial support from private donors seems to have diminished drastically since the end of the Cold War because of the phenomenon known as donor weariness. Just as uh, there was a need for a transnational institution to ensure that the market's accelerated integration would produce real benefits for all, that was the idea behind GATT, later transformed into World Trade Organization, in the same way there is a need today for a world anti-trafficking uh, agency or authority, because perhaps uh, human beings are not less relevant than commodities. My second conclusion is that as billions of dollars are beginning to be directed to the root causes of human trafficking, a logical approach would be to develop economic and social aid program in traditional sending regions. The challenge is to encourage economic and social development and political empowerment without reinforcing the power of entrenched local elites. In fact, while civilians may not partake in trafficking, they may have a vested interest in, seeking, in seeing the industry preserved. A type of intervention that can help cut the flow of money going to the traffickers is to raise the transaction cost by creating systematic obstruction along the trafficking routes. And to this end, a real challenge is to arrive at a metric on the basis of which it would be possible to gauge the impact of anti-trafficking activity. When I use the word metric, I mean not quantitative metrics, I mean qualitative metrics, because even qualitative substances can be measured, as we know. It is, was only due to positivistic epistemology who taught us that only quantity can be measured. But we know today that that is not uh, true. Finally, uh, an intriguing issue deserves uh, further attention. Recently, a colleague of us, uh, Albino Barrera from the States, uh, has published an interesting book called Market Complicity and Christian Ethic, published by Cambridge University Press. And he raises a fundamental question. Are we morally responsible for the distant arms spawned by our market transaction? If so, what are the grounds for these non-contractual obligations? The author identifies how the market's division of labor and specialization makes us unwitting collaborators in others' wrongdoing and in collective ills. There is a little scholarship on economic complicity and even less on moral complicity. And that is another nasty fact about which uh, we sooner or later should inquire. To what extent, uh, ask Barrera, Barrera is a, a Dominican father, professor of economics in the States, Notre Dame, are we culpable for the unintended consequences of our actions? Common sense tells uh, that we cannot be held to account for everything. But where do we draw the limits of our moral obligation? And to compound the dilemma, the dilemma is the fact that we often have to deal with accumulative arms in which acts that seen benign at the individual level become very injurious at an aggregated level. And an important case for market complicity is the strengthening of the work doing economic viability in the field of human trafficking. This occurs by increasing the demand of the wrongful activity. The incremental demand furnished by customers willing to buy the services provided by trafficked victims directly assist the many criminal organizations by pushing them beyond uh, their shutdown point, what has been called uh, the break-even point uh, in, uh, in, in, in accountancy. This occurs whenever increased consumer demand helps uh, these organizations to achieve economies of scale in production. 
And so individual buying decision can potentially be the tipping point in bringing the organization over the top to its optimum scale of production. The power of consumer agency is confirmed by hard empirical fact. So to conclude, it seems to me that there is a lot of work to do in front of us, and I am pretty sure that the role that such an academy, this academy, can play in this regard, just because of its nature of being a, an academy putting together people coming from different perspectives and from different scientific disciplines may play an important role. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, excellent presentation and uh, well kept within time. Now we have about half an hour for discussion. Yes, please. Thanks uh, for that paper, Stefano. Um, I was uh, happy when I read your paper uh, to see the mention of uh, Father Barrera's uh, book on market complicity and happy again that you were able to bring it in uh, to this discussion. Um, is that something that economists can address or is that something that's outside, that you needed the sociologists to address? How, and if uh, the economists can address that how? How do they address? Um, how would they talk about market complicity? Thank you. The idea of market complicity is strictly linked to the notion of pecuniary externalities. Now, in economic theory, Pigou, who was the pupil of Marshall, invented the notion of externalities. But he referred in his days, 1920, in his famous book, to technical externality. The most important case uh, example is pollution. Pollution is a negative externality. But um, when the globalization process, and in particular financialization of the economy started, a new type of externality emerged, namely pecuniary externalities. And today, pecuniary externalities are mo much more and more difficult to tackle and more insidious than the technical externalities. Because everybody observes technical externalities. If you pollute, I can detect you. But pecuniary externalities operate via the price mechanism. So they are impersonal and anonymous. That is why it is so difficult. To now, economic theory just started in the last few years to eat. There are, as far as I know, only one book and a, a, a dozen of articles on that. But uh, I noticed that among the younger generation of economists, a growing interest is again. And they also the World Bank is dedicating a lot. Because sometimes we t tend to take the market mechanism neutral. But market mechanism is not neutral at all. Only illiterate people can say like that. Illiterate people. Because there is a lot of evidence, a lot of theoretical thinking. And so uh, the point is that when before globalization, national authorities were capable to control uh, pecuniary externalities. Because, for instance, there was the control on uh, capital movements or labor movements. But now that uh, such controls do not exist, unless we operate uh, and put attention on the working of the price mechanism, in other words, price uh, changes are not only see, a way to allocate efficiently resources. They also allocate power. And the notion of power. That is why we need a dialogue between uh, sociologists, political theorists, economists. Because when we come to issues such as power, none of us can say, I am self-autonomous. I mean, if we talk about efficiency, I, as an economist, I could say, I stay alone. There is no need for you, if I feel, even though that is not true. But, also, but when we consider that pecuniary externalities redistribute power, power in the proper sense, then we come to understand the new. And that is the result of what is occurring. But I am rather, let's say, uh, hopeful that uh, in the near future, something is coming out. Christine. Thank you. 